hi everyone and welcome to today's iab member webinar how to use data to transform your strategy thanks for everyone to to sign up for today and to register and to attend we're very happy to have everyone on board we've got a good group here first a really quick overview of our webinar program the iab webinars provide an opportunity to learn from industry experts our presenters represent member companies who use this channel to take participants on a deep dive into the most relevant topics in digital advertising today's webinar presented by iab member dot dash formerly known as about dot com will be presented by dr john roberts chief innovation officer for dot dash and we'll discuss how publishers should listen to the internet every day in order to transform their monetization strategy as a quick housekeeping item we should have some time to take questions at the end of the presentation uh, to submit please just type your questions directly in the questions tab in the webinar panel we'll do our best to select questions at the end of the presentation based on time and availability today's session will be led by dr roberts but in advance i wanted to hand the floor to my colleague here at the iab who is closest to the iab's initiatives around data to briefly walk us through our activities in this area Dennis Buckheim is the Senior Vice President for Data and Ad Effectiveness and General Manager of the IAD's Data Center of Excellence. And I'm happy to give him the floor. Dennis, I'll let you take it away from here. Thank you, John, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just to open, I wanted to provide just a quick overview of how we think about data at IAB. Uh, you know, John mentioned the Data Center of Excellence, which really covers data and uh, all things data and automation for IAB now. Uh, and, and we really see, sort of as graphically depicted here, data and automation being uh, central enablers of many different activities, processes across the advertising ecosystems. You know, data is, is a means to many ends. Uh, it is not an end unto itself, as we, we say a lot. Um, so, you know, when you think about the, the, the path and uh, the effect that data can have, uh, for marketers, it's really around you know targeting and measurement and attribution. For publishers, it's you know how to drive effective, sustainable monetization. How to learn more about uh, you know what what are the the best practices for design uh, and and designing your site or your app uh, to uh, you know to ensure that in the final piece that consumers are um, are experience have the right experience and then of course that we're also collectively delivering relevant ads personalized ads and providing the right privacy controls to consumers so at that core of data uh, I'll, I'll briefly talk more in a moment about some of the projects here but we think about you know benchmarking the industry about uh, data activation identity in particular uh, and how we can create more you know more standards etc around identity and similarly around audience data next slide please so all of the data and automation initiatives undertaken by iab uh, with its members are overseen by the data board that was formed last year uh, current group members uh, the current members of the board and the group's mission is shown here uh, the, you know, I will say we're looking to expand this board somewhat at this point, and we're really uh, especially looking for more leaders in the automation and programmatic technology space. Uh, so if that's something you are interested in on behalf of your company, please contact me at dennis at iab.com. Next slide, please. For uh, you know, for many members, for the broader range of members, so not you know not just those who would be appropriate for the data board itself, we have really two channels of engagement. Uh, the first is committees, and the second is working groups. So the committees are really more the the interest groups, uh, and then the working groups are are very much where you know you roll up the sleeves, you you produce very tangible deliverables for data. Uh, on you know specifically to for data, we have. A data benchmarks and activation committee that's about to be kicked off. I'll come back to some of the projects in that area, and then an identity and audience data committee um, that is really focused on identity standards for you know for the consumer identifiers uh, and data quality audience data quality standards. So if those are groups you'd like to be involved in, uh, we can absolutely help get you signed up for that too. And then uh, on the automation side, next slide, please. We have uh, both a buy side and a sell side automation committee that are about to kick off. So that, you know, we've really revamped the structure to a large degree of, uh, of the committees and working groups around data and automation, really recognizing, again, the central role that 
uh, that data and automation play uh, in our business. And again, if you're interested in automation slash programmatic uh, and you want to be on one of these committees, just let us know. And then finally, before I hand it off to John, next slide, please. Um, this is you know, a very high level list of uh, what we're really focused on for the balance of the year in data and automation. I touched on you know, the Benchmarks and Activation Committee, which is really designed to oversee the industry data benchmarks, the organizational data benchmarks, the education and activation activities listed here. And then the audience data, uh, the Identity and Audience Data Committee is overseeing consumer identity, audience data quality and segmentation. And then finally, the buying and selling automation activities listed at the bottom here. Um, are overseen by those other two new committees on buy side and sell side automation. Uh, in the context of today's presentation by Dot Dash, I think I would call out the state of data, uh, which is both looking at or looking at both the organizational uh, readiness and and you know how organizations can be more effective in becoming you know quote unquote data centric, uh, and then the data market sizing that we're looking at at pursuing. We're starting to pursue and should deliver by the end of the year to help understand the flows of data across the industry, uh, the revenue associated with different types of data, potentially the, the cost or pricing associated with different types of data on an index basis. I would also call out the data maturity model. Again, very much focused on working effectively with data and helping understand where your organization is stronger or weaker with regard to the use of data and particularly on the org readiness side and org structure side, I think that's a uh, that actually is pretty relevant to some of what you hear from Dot Dash. Uh, and then uh, the last two things I call out would be our data symposium uh, at the end of the year, December 4th in New York. Uh, if that's something of interest, watch out for that. If you'd like to sponsor it, let us know, please. Uh, but that's really looking again at data as this central element and and how it can be a strong enabler across everything from you know, targeting and measurement to personalization and publisher monetization. Finally, uh, audience data quality, audience data segmentation work, I think is another relevant area to what you'll hear today. Really trying to get a better understanding of uh, consistency, a trend more transparent and better understanding of consistency of data um, and, and quality of data as distinct from the efficacy of data or the performance associated with different types of data. So helping a, the baseline that you know you're working with good data to begin with, uh, and in this in this case from an audience data perspective. Um, and with that, I will say, you know, I think you'll uh, you'll enjoy hearing more about uh, you know how you can approach and develop insights uh, for marketers and for publishers uh, to optimize buying and selling. You'll even hear a bit about you know how machine learning plays a role or AI in quotes. Uh, can play a role alongside humans and and hopefully help all of us contribute more uh, to deriving more effective and richer insights and you know, let the machines do some of the heavy lifting, but um, let the people do a lot more of the, the, you know, the deeper insights extraction. So with that, I'm pleased to hand it over to John Roberts. Well, thanks very much uh, for the introduction. Thanks for, for that, that lead in that definitely frames um, the, the content of what we're going to talk about here uh, today in the time that we've got. Um, so a little bit of background uh, from myself. Um, the doctor in front of my name isn't the useful kind of doctor. I'm a physicist. Uh, I was a research scientist for 10 years. Um, and so I actually came to what was then about.com um, as an ex-physicist uh, from NYU um, who then walked into a company that recently been acquired by IAC uh, back in 2013. Um, and actually our CEO at the time, um, when I met him, said, oh, you're the guy who works on dark matter. Uh, wh why did we hire you? Um, and this deck is kind of the, the refutation of why that was a question that should even be asked at that point. And the world that we live in has a lot more data scientists now than it did back in 2013 or 2014. Um, and I think what we're, gonna, what we're gonna cover here is some of the kinds of things that you can learn when you apply a, a scientific approach or systematic methodology to the problems that you run into as a internet publisher, right? or if you're in marketing, uh, the way you deal with it uh, from that side. Um, from a scientist's perspective, the internet is the biggest experiment done on humanity that's ever been conducted. And it allows us to track everything and every engagement that's been done at all those different points in time. When I walked in, one of the first questions that um, I heard getting asked over and over again was, 
traffic's up, traffic's down, things are happening. Is this seasonal or did we do something? Did something happen uh, or is it just the world? Science as a discipline, um, before it was ever even considered to be called data science, we've got data scientists forever, ever, we just call them scientists, um, is about extracting meaningful uh, insights from very messy data. Like no, no world has clean, simple, well-structured, well-formatted data. And the plot that you see here is actually the response of a, um, a photo detector in a water tank in the high Andes that makes up part of a 3,000 square kilometer telescope array looking at cosmic rays from other galaxies. Right? And what you can see here is a clear seasonality, right? You can basically spot winter, right? That's the very tight clustering of points, and you can spot summer in between there where it's much broader. Um, and the fact that it's the response of a PNT isn't particularly interesting, but the fact that you can see the clear seasonality in the signal frank frankly should not have been there. <laughs> and the question was, is this seasonal? Or is this actually something? Is, does the universe know what our winter looks like? And the answer is clearly no, <laughs> like it shouldn't be the case. Um, but that was a core question that was being asked and answered across a lot of very, very messy data. And um, it turns out the internet has also got a lot of very messy data. Um, and it is consistently difficult to take large, messy data sets, large, messy data, data problems, and bring order and structure to them in a way that you can derive insights right, for your organization. So um, particularly around that kind of question of seasonality, being able to show not only that the world changed, but you did something that changed the world on top of that, is a challenging problem for everyone that we work with. As a publisher, as an advertiser, our clients, our agency clients, um, all have these questions. We did something, did we change the world? Um, and it's exactly these kinds of analyses that allow us to really tackle that. So what we're gonna cover uh, in this session that we're talking through here is how you actually and pragmatically go about doing that, right? Because it's not particularly interesting if you all have to be like data scientists to be able to do this. It's much more useful if we can figure out as an industry how we all apply this to the problems that we're doing because that helps us get smarter, faster about the tactics and strategies that we run. Um, so hopefully by the end of this, I'll have persuaded at least a good chunk of you that you actually can do these kind of experiments yourself with your data and you really should be. Um, before we get into the process of how that works, I just want to talk a little bit about data, data science, machine learning, AI, and those words that get thrown around a lot. Uh, I kind of feel like the word, the phrase big data has now been pushed to one side. We're not hearing that so much around, but machine learning has taken over that somewhat meaningless uh, overuse that we've had a lot. Um, there are two different ways to think about uh, data science and data research. Um, data can allow humans to learn, right? This is a, like, a consultancy group would do this, a theoretical research scientist would do this. You take data, you take a problem, you uh, apply research to that data and you come up with an insight, right? It's going to be a deck, a finding, a strategy, uh, a direction you should take with some, ident uh, some understanding of the risk uh, that that strategy brings with it. So that's like, the end result of this is somebody makes a choice, right? That's the output of this type of working with data. Somebody is able to make a choice with confidence that they weren't able to make before. You can also think about machine learning, right, which is also lumped in with data science. But when machines are learning, they are learning how to do something more or better, right? Classic machine learning problems are, you know, there's an example of a big telecom company that wanted to understand the likelihood of somebody defaulting on uh, a contract, right? And they had a, a um, a mainframe that did that calculation for them, and that mainframe was dying. So they worked with an IBM or a Cisco or whoever it was to figure out how much it would cost to rebuild this mainframe, and it was going to be prohibitively expensive. And this was a small handful of years ago, so the fact it was a mainframe was crazy. Uh, but that's what they needed because that's how it worked. And then they talked to a data scientist who was a machine learning data scientist, and he said, "Did you keep all the input? Did you keep all the output? And most critically." Do you care why it's right, or do you just need it to be right? Right, you just need to be like 99.5% correct all the time, and you don't need to know why you are right about whether somebody's going to default or not. Um, and they said, yes, we actually don't need to know why, but we do need it to be very accurate. Right. So then, what you do is you throw a bunch of machine learning uh, models at the input and the output until you can reliably and consistently reproduce all of the outputs from the inputs, and you don't need to know why that model gets from A to B in a particular scenario accurately every single time, right? It just is part of the process and the running of your systems that gets you that level of accuracy. Um, 
and that's perfect because uh, machines are extraordinarily good at finding correlations and insights uh, that they can actually latch onto and model in a very detailed way. Um, but the systems, pretty much by definition, the more powerful it is in that world, the less interpretable it becomes. Right. So. Yes, you get a lot better at doing a thing, but you don't necessarily know why you're better at doing that thing. Um, and so that gives you this kind of dichotomy of either I can be very good at optimizing this particular outcome, uh, but not knowing necessarily why, or I can take a really big bet um, and take a whole new strategy where we don't have any data because we've not done it yet based on what we've learned about the world. Right? And those are two quite different classes of problems. There are many problems that, that walk the line between those two, but it gives you quite a clear mindset of, of thinking about those two different types of uses of data. Now, a lot of the time in what gets talked about these days, we talk a lot about optimization problems with data science, partly because Google, Facebook, IBM, like all these guys are dealing with vast amounts of data where small incremental percentage gains and optimizations are transformative to their businesses. Um, and so they do a lot of machine learning, right? If you think about it this way, Google is one of the most sophisticated machine learning and AI companies in the world. They have <clears throat> petabytes of data to train on, um, and they're trying to do a problem that no human can do. Actually, amusingly, about.com, when it was founded right back in 1996, was founded on the principle that it was hard to find things on the internet. Does that sound familiar at all? Uh, and so what we did was we employed a bunch of experts who understood the internet and were able to guide you around the internet. We used to call our writers guides because they were providing a human curated view of the internet. This was how to discover content in the in the world. Um, Google was founded a year later and basically came along and said, that's cute, we've got this, um, and built one of the world's largest machine learning systems to go sort and organize the world's information and provide it to you. They do this by taking billions of potential results to the question that you're asking and filtering that down to 10 things, right? Machines are extraordinarily good at being trained by humans into what those 10 things should be. And Google's been learning for over a decade how to get better and better and better at doing that. But at the end of the day, it's a human that has to pick from those 10 things and decide that is the thing I actually wanted to know right now, right? And that choice that you're making against those 10 things is continually educating Google. So. Actually, even though it's a machine learning problem, it's a very, very tight collaboration between all of the users and with Google's machine learning, where the machine learning gets you from a billion down to 10, and the human applies all of that common sense and intuition and everything else to get from 10 to one. Humans are very good at making decisions on 10 things. Machines are very good at sorting billions of things. We're both very bad at doing the other's job. So when you're dealing with the interface between human insight and intuition, humans are very good at innovating and making big logical leaps, and, and machines are far, far better than humans at optimizing. Um, but it's a good way of just thinking about those two different pieces of the problem. And obviously, as AI develops, we're going to get in a world where more and more of, uh, of that kind of gray area, where it's like a human piece of subject matter expertise, it will be picked up and modeled by machines. But those actual decisions and leaps and steps that are taken are most usefully applied by humans when they have a small number of options to pick from. The machine just hasn't had to make that choice before, it doesn't even have the context underpinning why that choice is made. Okay, that's a lot of context <laughs> for the deck. But let's get into why this matters to a publisher, right? So a way you would think about a publisher is to say, well, okay, we have a lot of content, uh, we push that out to the world, the world reads it, and we're done, right? That's, that's our job, to produce content and distribute it. Um, if that was true, we wouldn't have a data science team here, right? And you wouldn't have a bunch of, of research scientists because what the internet has allowed us to do is actually say, we put out a piece of content, that piece of content gets read by the world, it gets interacted with by the world, people share it, they move it around, they respond to it, they close it down, and all of those are useful signals. Right? So this actually allows us to use content to ask a question to the entire country. And that's interesting. Right? That suddenly allows you to use content and the world audience as a means of asking questions to the world. So how would you actually set up an experiment like this? Well, this is basically a rundown of the scientific methodology, right? You really didn't expect to be doing that on a, uh, on a Thursday afternoon, but I will explain why this is relevant to you as we get there, so stick with me. So firstly, identify your question, right? This is, I think, the most overlooked piece of any actual research study or any question or any experiment that's run. Um, 
it is extraordinarily hard to get to the right question. And to give you a clue, the right question is never, how do I make people click on an ad? Um, the question is actually, what is it that you would need to know the answer to to make a decision? Like, what decision are you trying to make? What do you need to know to be able to make that decision? How do you find, like, for yourself, what that question is that if you had the answer, you would now do something different, right? If the question is, oh, like, do I put this in red or do I put this in purple, and how does the world react to that? You've already decided your, what your answer is. Your answer is it's red or purple, right? That's, that's not the question. Like, the question should be much more, I think the world likes red and purple. <laughs> Am I actually right about that at all? Like, is that actually what's causing uh, something to, uh, to change? So getting to the right question is critical. Um, once you've got the right question, getting the right answer is actually fairly straightforward most of the time. Um, once you've got the question, you actually need to predict what you think the answer is. Right? If you don't go in with a clear expectation with that, like a personal horse in the race, then you're actually not going to surprise yourself. You're not going to change your mind. You're not going to understand when something is interesting, right? If you're working with a team who's answering this question for you, you need to tell them what you think the answer is, right? Because they need to know when it's important that they've proved something wrong or come up with a new innovation. Your prediction is effectively a statement of your subject matter expertise. Then when you actually build the test with a clear prediction and a clear question, it becomes very straightforward to say, okay, here are the pieces of content that actually allow us to answer that or even ask that question and challenge that prediction. Putting that content in front of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of people gives you then the data set you need to really understand what happened. Like who reacted, how did they react? Did they react in a way that surprised you or did they react in a way that confirmed what you suspected would occur? Right? That they did it is one thing. Why they did it is another thing. If you're talking about cohorts of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, a subset of that group is going to actually be driving your signal. If you think about this back to like, a class of like ad, ad interaction, like if you if your click through rate goes up by 50%, that's not because everybody clicked 50% more. It's because likely because one group clicked like 10 times more, and another group clicked like 20% less. Right? So you really need to understand what is the division, what is the single feature or the group of features that drove that change in people's behavior, right? That something changed is lovely, right? But why it changed is far more interesting. So if you understand why something changed, then you know what the next piece of strategy is, the next decision you're going to make, rather than just saying, oh, we did this thing, we're done now. Like, that's it, we're, we're finished innovating. And so that's the process, right? This is literally a checklist you can work through if you want to ask and answer a question in the world of content. What I'll do here is actually run through a few examples of how we've done that. Um, and hopefully that'll help color in a few of the steps and a few of the things that you can actually tactically do inside your organization to apply this yourself. So this is our laboratory. Right? This is the, the laboratory of dot dash um, as it pertains to this particular question. About.com was founded in 1996. Uh, this data stretches back to January 1st, 2000. Um, the data does live before that, but it's in, like literally on magnetic tape, um, and so I refuse to go digging that deeply into there. Um, on the far right is basically the present day, um, and the vertical axis here is the scale. Right, This is a pretty good view of the growth of the internet um, since the beginning of the millennium. There aren't a lot of plots in the world like this. They don't really exist. Um, we are extraordinarily privileged because the, the dot dash network basically ranks for one in three of all queries on Google, right, somewhere, um, which means that we have an incredibly broad view into what the world cares about. Um, and we drive traffic from search, we drive from email, from social, from all these different places, but we capture interest around all topics. Um, and so what you see in the, like, the strata of these different colored bands here is each of the different verticals that we work in. So health is one of the bands. Uh, travel is that green band in the middle. Food is that kind of Sandy Brown section, so a bunch of recipes in there. Um, money and finance is close to the top. Um, and so those broad bands are overall vertical interest, and then the thin bands in between are individual topics within those bands. There's about a 1,000 individual topics broken down and classified here in those colored sets. Um, and this gives us a very privileged view into the evolving interests of the entire country, and in fact the world, over the course of the last like 17 years. Um, the things that you see here are kind of regular patterns. You see like broad dips, 
uh, that summer. That's people getting off the internet. That's people going outside and going on holiday and not being at work because most people read the internet at work. Um, the sharp dip you see each year is December. Um, that's the holidays. That's people going home to their families uh, and getting off the internet. That's very good for all of our health. Um, and then the peaks on either side are November and January. So you see this kind of double peak every year, uh, like clockwork, and it's basically the heartbeat of the internet, right? You see that, that pulse every year. And it's not that all topics get less interest in, in December. Food actually spikes in December as people do their holiday cooking. Um, tech has a spike then too. Um, but in aggregate, in totality across the entire interest of the internet, firstly, the internet grew a hell of a lot in 10 years, right? You can literally see the growth of the internet here. That's why it's much, much bigger on the right than on the left. Um, and then kind of saturates as, as the internet doesn't actually get that much bigger, right? People mostly who were going to be on the internet were on the internet by 2010, 2011. Um, then you can also pull out individual events from here, right? So you can see a little like dark green dagger that turns up along the middle of that band there, like clockwork. And that's our travel content. It's October. Um, and it's big enough as a movement of a single topic to be visible on a plot of effectively the, the interest of the internet. That's actually our uh, advice about traveling to New England. Um, it's leaf peeping. It's people wanting to go and see fall colors. Um, and that drives a big enough spike in interest uh, to be visible on a plot of this scale across all of these topics, and only in October. Right? And it happens every year, and it happens at the same scale every year. The internet, actually, and the country's interest as captured by the internet are remarkably predictable. You see other things in here, like the large brand blobs that you see on the bottom there, those correlate to US military action. And they're obviously not very predictable because that has been quite a, a significant series of events over the course of the last 17 years. Um, it's not our military family content, it's not our uh, PTSD content, it's not our foreign policy, foreign relations uh, content, or even military careers. Um, it's actually our political humor content. When the country goes to war, people need to laugh, actually, um, but at a, a massive scale uh, that drives huge interest and change in behavior across the country. Um, so the reading patterns of the internet and of the country tell you things about the country. Like it's a laboratory that actually lets us understand the changing face of this country. And this is because a piece of content is asking a question. Right? In this world where we can track who's read, who's engaged, who's reacted to a, um, a piece of content, what we're really asking is, are you interested in this? Right? And if you think about different publishers on the internet, we ask those things in different ways. If you're a news publisher, you're saying, this thing happened today. Like, this is an interesting thing that happened. This is why it's interesting. Are you interested in this? And each day, it's a different story. Like, it's a new topic. It's a new breaking piece of news. It's a new event in the world. It's a new celebrity baby. It's a new piece of political news that's blown up. Um, even though those news stories may start to sound awfully familiar week in, week out, unlike in this year, um, you are asking people whether they're interested in that event that has happened. But the story is different each day. As an evergreen publisher, uh, as a publisher who has lots of content that's out there that answers the same or very similar questions a year in, year out, day in, day out, we're listening to what people care about. If the New York Times is saying, this is the thing that happened today, you should care about it, we are listening to what people care about in a particular day as a group of reference publishers, right, where we provide answers to questions people have. And that's a very different data set. Right? If you're a news publisher, you can do the same thing, but you're doing it in a slightly more volatile way, or you should be understanding, oh, actually, we broke this story. Yeah, that mattered today. Like That really was an interesting thing. We can now query that audience and find out what that specific audience cared about today um, and which group most clearly reacted to it. As a publisher with tens or hundreds of thousands of pieces of content that get some traction every single day, um, we have the privilege of looking at that across the whole broad swath uh, of interest. Um, that's just a very different type of data set. So for the Evergreen Publishing, which we're going to talk about today, and I'll explain why, where and why you would tweak this if you're a news publisher or if you're talking about like trending uh, or like more socially viral topics, the same methodology applies. It's just kind of a slightly different focus for what I cover today. Um, from the Evergreen Publisher version of it, right, we can really treat the entire corpus of all of our content as a very stable and very large panel, like a very big data set that we collect on every day. So if each piece of content is an experiment, we're running tens of thousands, or in our case, hundreds of thousands created experiments that run for years, 
right? We have very long baselines against this. People uh, have been reading this content or answering these questions for many years. Um, it's seen by tens of millions of people, right? Um, I think our current number is something like 57 million a month um, and growing. Um, so it's a huge scale experiment. We're seeing a statistically significant proportion of the entire country every day. Um, and interestingly, and this is important, when people are interacting with content, they don't know they're being asked a question, right? Like, to be fair, we didn't know we were asking a question until we started thinking about it this way. So our audience for sure didn't know, right? Um, people are biased when they answer polls and surveys. If you're talking about like a Visu study or a Nielsen survey, like they're great for getting people's like actual conscious reaction to a question they're being asked. But anybody who's done any research science in psychology or neuroscience or these kind of know that there is a bias just to having been asked a question, right? That comes with conscious bias in how people answer questions. But if you talk about how people consume content, about read things, even the searches they do in Google, like that is an unbiased view into what that person cares about. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we, we go deep into here. But if you talk about this and frame it in scientific language, long baseline, large scale, anonymous, safe and unbiased, like that is a phenomenal laboratory to use as a way of understanding an audience, their profiles, their cares, their wishes, their interests, as that develops over time. So how do you actually go about doing this, right? That's all lovely to say that this thing exists, but how do you actually do this tactically as a publisher or as a creative agency or as a brand to put a message out and understand your audience by how they interact with that message? Step one, get to the question that actually makes them, that matters to you. So it's never, how do I click an ad, right? But this is a list of literal questions that, we, that I've been asked either internally uh, inside the company um, or externally by agency or brand partners that we have worked with. So think about it as, like, is the topic, the type of interest, the topic you care about, does, is that the question you want to know about? So, for example, do people care more about gymnastics during the Olympics or football during the Super Bowl, right? Simple question, interesting question for sure. Um, as somebody who, as I'm sure you can all hear, isn't a native uh, uh, citizen of this country. Um, I was very curious in finding out about uh, people's interest in football, or as I would call it, not real football. Um, do people care about the sentiment? Like, do people read more positive or negative financial content in 2008 versus 2017? Could we actually see people starting to get concerned about their finance before uh, 2008 happened? Can you actually predict or see something like that coming. Can you use reading behavior on the internet to, for example, correlate to or predict stock market volatility? Answer, yeah, you actually 100% can. It's kind of amazing. Um, but that's a question around like different sentiment around a topic. The complexity, like do people care about quick reads or in-depth coverage? How does that map onto different platforms of discovery methods? Do people read different content on Facebook or social than on search, than on email, than uh, on video content, like long form or short form video content is, is a very different question here. What about the timing? Like, do people care about gift giving in December or the other periods in the year where we can think about this? Right? That's obviously a brand strategy question, right? The result of all of these can be that people clicking on ads more. The data set you use to really answer it could also be people clicking or engaging with ads. But that's like the very tactical piece of this. These things can all help you actually change not only your advertising or your marketing strategy, but your entire company strategy, right? You can imagine companies for all of these who their entire strategy would be transformed by a clear answer to this question. We're also answered, asked, uh, are kittens more related to cuteness or to cats? Like the concept of a kitten. That was a question I actually got asked. Um, and just so we can get past this, I'll, I'll give you answer to these ones later. Uh, but that one is kittens are quantifiably more closely related to cuteness than to cats. Um, it's an important thing for us all to know. Um, it's a fun question to answer too. Um, okay, so really interrogate the question you're asking, right? Because often the first thing is what the question you're asking is actually the answer you think is going to answer your question, not the question you need to be asking. So challenge really deep assumptions that are driving your business strategy and really ensure that what you're really asking is the thing that helps you make a transformative choice. Um, it is definitely true that getting to the right question is harder than being able to answer it. Um, once you've got to the point where the, the question is really something that will change your mind and change your strategy, then it becomes really clear how you go about answering the question. 
Okay. So once you got to this very hard thing of like the platonic ideal of the question you need to ask right now that will transform your business, like that small thing, um, then you make a prediction, right? Each of these questions has an implicit assumption baked into it, right? Because you have a bias, a personal belief. You wouldn't be asking this question if you didn't think you already knew the answer to it somehow, but you're just not sure enough in that answer to actually make a bet based on it, right? Most of the best questions are actually questions that if they turn out to be true, it's great because then you just go and make the decision that you kind of thought you should make, but you're not actually going to make a bet on. So I predict the Super Bowl drives more sport interest than gymnastics, right? But yes, I think football really is the big driving interest here. Um, I predict that 2008 caused people to read more content on foreclosures and debt, but that trend had reversed well before 2017, right? That core economic indicators were improving. I predict that like successful social hits are shorter and simpler, like there's simple snackable content on social and deep long reads are more successful on search. I predict that December is in fact the peak for gift giving interest, right? These are uh, predictions that we came to, uh, assumptions that we made about the world that we turned into very explicit predictions. Um, and actually, I'm going to run through the answers to these uh, right now very quickly. Um, the first one, I was wrong. Um, it's actually gymnastics during the Olympics, not football during the Super Bowl, and that's U.S. audience specifically, um, which surprised me uh, for sure, uh, given the, the volume of interest around the Super Bowl in general. Um, the gymnastics is a huge event. It also stretches out longer for the Olympics, uh, which accounts for actually a loss of that volume. Uh, but it is bigger in terms of total uh, interest. Um, 2008, yes, there was a huge spike in foreclosure uh, interest at that point in time and debt. Um, but the trend actually hadn't significantly reversed by 2017, right? Uh, it turns out that um, that belief in negative economic content held right through into the end of 2015 and only just then started to deteriorate. So people's belief in their finances did not track the change in core economic indicators about those finances. So even though uh, the like, foreclosure rates, uh, median income, um, job market volatility, people starting to move jobs more often, all were good clean indicators of uh, a, a dramatic economic recovery occurring over those years. People's belief in that lagged by at least five years, um, which obviously drove a big change in the 2016 election, right? Because one candidate campaigned on belief, right? The economy was not getting better. And one camp candidate campaigned on reality, which is that the economy was fundamentally getting better. And both of them were right, right? Because the belief and the reality were not tracking each other, so both of them could actually be correct. Um, the success of social hits, actually, that up to this particular scenario, turned out not to be true. Longer articles uh, do great on Facebook, and the deeper and longer the article for the case that we've looked at, um, drove deeper, longer social shares. Right? Um, lots of correlating factors in there uh, that drive that. And December, yes, yeah, December is obviously a peak for gift giving interest within a particular period, but there's another huge spike for gift giving interest all through the summer, which obviously correlates with wedding season. Wedding gifts is a big thing, but you know what correlates with wedding gifts? Anniversary gifts. Like people have to buy anniversary gifts with significant others every single year, um, and that correlates to when wedding season is. So there is a huge gift giving season um, that, for the client we were working with, was a very big wake up call uh, that marketing to people in a way that would help them find good gifts for their husbands, particularly in that particular case, uh, was something that had uh, a lot of white space, a lot of open area for them to work with uh, over the course of the summer. Okay, that's coming out with a prediction where the prediction is based on your own internal beliefs, like being honest about what you believe your biases to be so that when you get an answer, you actually know whether you are going to be right or not. And actually, as a scientist, I'm much, much, much happier to be wrong uh, because then I've learned something, right? If all that happened is we did a test and I've confirmed my belief, why did I do the test? I'm not going to do anything differently. I'm just going to do it with maybe a little bit more confidence. That's not interesting. That you want to actually test things that are going to change your mind, and then you want to be really, really happy when you turn out to be wrong. Um, there's the quantitative version of prediction as well, rather than like the internal belief version of prediction. So in this case, taking tech trends is an extreme example. This is a plot of daily tech interest on the internet uh, by Day, right? This is saying on a particular day, the total tech interest will be up or down by 5%, 10%, 20%, 30%. Um, this is actually based off 
15 years of data, 10 years that we're actually using as a stable window here. Um, remember, the internet and tech has changed a lot in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so we're actually using data on people who are reading about PAM pilots, right? And understanding that kind of content to predict the daily tech interest in 2017. Astonishingly, that actually works, <laughs> which it shouldn't do. Right? It's like the most volatile uh, interest area that we've got right now, and yet it still works, right? And actually from here, what you can see is right slap bang in the middle there on day 152, 53 is Black Friday, right? So you can see Black Friday as a clear spike. You can see the ramp up in tech interest to Black Friday. And you can see a very small dip on Christmas, and then you see a massive spike afterwards where people actually have to deal with all the tech. They just got gifted, right? That's the, I need to go set up my tech spike. Um, and then on Jan 1, just after New Year's Eve, you still get all of that a little spike there. And then it's a clean, simple, smooth run down to the summer. Um, and then it bumps up back again in the fall around the time that you uh, that people go back to school and look at their back to school interest. Actually, a little bump in the middle there, which is around um, tax season. People getting tax rebates and buying tech gifts for this reason. Apple uh, often does high tech launches in the spring to line up with April 15th. They're there for a reason, like the, the tech interest is actually super clean. And um, so it's totally possible to do this. The thing that this tells us is that individuals are totally unpredictable, right? A, a single person can care about a piece of tech interest or not today, right? I have no idea whether you, you as an individual are going to actually want to deal with your tech today. Like your tech is unpredictable. You don't know whether it's going to break today or not. But thousands, tens of thousands or millions of people are totally predictable, right? So we don't know who necessarily as an individual is going to care about their tech. But if you talk about very, very, very large samples, that's going to be predictable day after day. So with that kind of a prediction, you can actually challenge your assumptions. So with a zero prediction, you can see the world change, right? The challenge here is to say, I know what the world looks like on a normal day. Why is this day or this test, this group, this subset of data different from the, uh, the normal course of business? In September 2001, we saw the world change, right? We saw Islam spike in interest. That's the conscious interest of a country, a conscious question people had to go ask. We also saw weight loss jump up by over 300% in a single day. That is the subconscious, the unconscious interest of the country uh, causing them to do something different. This is the fight or flight reaction of a whole country kicking in. This is the, re the subconscious response to being attacked. September 11th was a health event for the whole country. You put out a, uh, a visitor study, a Nielsen study to ask people about uh, their interests on that day. Nobody's going to tell you that they, want, they decided to go to the gym and get fit, but the whole country did. Right? The whole country reacted in that way. That is the subconscious benefit of using this as a panel that gets to people's unconscious changes in behavior. In 2008, the world changed. Right? In October 2008, interest in budget recipes doubled. All financial indicators showed that recovery happened very cleanly after 2009, but budget recipe interest didn't start to climb until late 2015. We just talked about around the, the economic interest of a country. The financial crisis shows up in the country's cooking habits. Right? Again, this is not a conscious change that the country's gone through. This is the unconscious uh, change in behavior from a very large disruptive event happening to the country. Right? As a scientist, you always want to go look for the big signals first and then make sure you can prove them before you start going looking for subtle things. The so publishers as a group measure the interest of the country every single day, either if you're a news publisher looking at what people care about in the news, or if you're an evergreen publisher looking at that baseline interest and how it evolves over time. Content allows us to listen to the conscious and subconscious cares in the country and see how that is changing. If you're thinking about a publisher just as a place to go put an ad, you're missing a whole chunk of value right, about how we deal with the world. So how do you treat a piece of content as an experiment? Figure out what you want to know, Establish a stable baseline expectation. Make sure the content actually tests your assumptions, right? Putting out two slightly different variations of the same messaging isn't going to tell you anything. Put up the thing that says, I know what you care about, this is what you want, and then put out something wholly different, right? Something that challenges your assumptions that if it were to be the more engaging piece of content, you would have your mind changed, right? Then study how thousands of people interact with your content and prepare to be surprised. Um, it is absolutely the best way to listen to the cares of the country, for sure. The content is the means to an end. The content is the means that helps you understand what you're actually after, which is your users, right? Your actual audience. So once you've got the content and you've got the baseline, you've got the experiment, then you get to ask, why did this work? 
right? And when you ask, why did this work? What you're really asking is, who reacted to this? What subset of this audience reacted to this? So just like you say to your content, this is economically positive, this is economically negative, this is uh, a particular topic, this is another particular topic, you want to take your users and say, okay, these are millennials, this is by gender, this is by device, this is by the network that they are on, by the time of day they're accessing the internet, by the day of week, whatever that might be, find the subset, the audience you care about there, and compare them to the behavior of the whole, right? So take a subset group and see how they behave compared to the average behavior of the entire audience you're looking at. So you can do this with millennials, right? Taking just the 18 to 24 year olds versus the entire average expectation of interest in all health topics. 18 to 24 over index for an interest in teen health, eating disorders, addictions, schizophrenia, acne, STDs, phobia, contraception, and social anxiety disorder, right? 25 to 35, we see them over index for breastfeeding, pregnancy, miscarriage, uh, preemie babies, infertility, and, and multiples. Right. Millennial health interests actually haven't changed that much, right? These are just the, the problems of people in their late teens, early 20s, and uh, late 20s and early 30s. Um, although, actually, social anxiety disorder isn't an age specific condition, but it is an age specific condition for this generation, right? There's some stress and some anxiety thrown into this generation's health problems. Uh, but health problems haven't generally changed. The questions we asked haven't changed. It's just that we now ask the internet for that help rather than a friend, a family member, a doctor. Um, what do millennials care about? In finance, it's forex trading, beginners investing, stocks and money in your 20s. Car insurance is right down at the end of that list. Uh, true also in 25 to 35. That's a little surprising. Crowdfunding's in there, right? Kickstarter is a real thing. Um, the core economic information is a little surprising until you realize that millennials kind of grew up, became adults during the financial crisis. Yes, the markets, stocks, investing. It really matters, right? Because it can have a direct and violent impacts on your financial future. Of course we care about finance. Um, we see clear gender divides, right? Millennial women we see as being three times more interested in going to Paris than non-millennial women, but millennial men are actually just as uninterested in going to Paris as non-millennial men, right? It's a very, very clear uh, divide. Um, although to be fair, the millennial men should totally take their girlfriends to Paris. Uh, <laughs> it's fun when you can use a 17-year-old uh, I uh, know, like 20, 21 year old uh, website to provide dating advice to the entire country. Um, interest by gender actually shows a consistent and regular pattern, right? The most predictive interests of a man age, man's age are self directed. True in general, broadly, obviously, individuals completely buck that trend, um, but you can predict a man's age by the, uh, by the age of the topics he cares about. Whereas for women, the most predictive interests of a woman's age reflect the age of the people that she cares for, right? For men, in their health interests, it goes from weight training to running to triathlons, all the way from 20s through 30s. At 45, it goes from running to walking, which is depressing, uh, and a view into our future. And then over 55, we see prostate cancer turn up and other age-specific conditions uh, that men suffer from. Um, for women, for the same uh, set of topics across health, we see pregnancy content, uh, obviously in their 20s. We see kid, infant health and then kids' health through... Um, their 30s and ADHD and childhood learning comes in there as well. At 45, we see a big spike over to dementia, assisted living, Parkinson's. And then over 55, it's prostate cancer again, right? This is not the condition they're caring for. If you find uh, a cookie pool or an audience that cares about ADHD and prostate cancer, this isn't a schizophrenic teenager with an early prostate problem. This is a mother and a daughter and a wife caring about that whole suite of people, right? This is actually really interesting because I don't care who you are, right? I can track your interests, and if you're a guy, I'll get you mostly right. That's lovely. But if you're a woman, I'm going to get you wholly wrong, right? If I build a profile of interest around you and the cookie that you uh, that you have, and I can do all across device matching and really profile the hell, of you, I'm actually not going to get to that uh, piece of data because what I really need to know is who you care about right now, right? And that's likely not yourself. And it's also likely driven by something that has got nothing to do um, with what you were doing a month ago, what you were doing two months ago, what you were doing five months ago. Now, we do a lot of audience targeting in the world. Uh, it's one of the, the big promises of ad tech. It has a very, very strong place in the world for signals that are true for a long period of time, right? Your age, your gender, the size of your household, your general income, like your professional career. These are things that absolutely you can go build a model of a profile. And they'll be true tomorrow, just like they were true today for most of those things. But you want a cat, right? That's an important thing that we can keep track of for a long, a long period of time. 
what you care about right now is very, very, very unlikely to be tied to that profile that's been built up, right? The reason you go to a health site at three o'clock in the morning to read about what to do with a kid with 105 degree fever is because in the real world, five minutes ago, you found out your kid had 105 degree fever. Not Google, not Facebook, not Amazon, not anyone knows that that is the case. But when you turn up on a health site reading that content, we know right then exactly that that is the problem that you have because we're helping you solve it, right? That degree of intent that degree of problems that we see, that very, very, very immediate top of mind problem makes you a different person, makes you a different target or a prospect to do that content recommendation to, whether that content recommendation is the next thing that we need to help you with with reading or ad creative that's being put there because let's face it, advertising companies are also trying to help you solve your problems. They're just doing it with money involved, right? And it's a critical difference to think about how do I understand you right now versus how I understand you long term. And just like the difference between machine learning and data science, these are both approaches to the same types of problems, but the two very different classes of problems, right? And we focus a lot on one uh, as an industry in the last 10 years, um, but we've slightly forgotten that actually who you, like, you know more about who you are right now than any data scientist ever could. If I truly believe that I know more about your health problems right now than you do, that is a level of spectacular hubris and arrogance as a data scientist um, that it's an easy trap to fall into. We proved to ourselves actually that that wasn't the right way to provide content to our users. Um, and so we backed off and built like light predictive models, but we really privilege the signals that you provide us with right now. So what did we learn as a company? Um, more ads doesn't mean more revenue, right? That was a, a key learning that we discovered from having a bat.com, right? We, it looked not awesome. Um, and we spent a lot of time trying to optimize the thing that we had. And what we actually learned in the process was that adding more ads to the page really, really, really doesn't make you more money, right? And if you were on the internet in Q4 of 2016, um, and you had your browser crash on you on a regular basis because of the heavy ad weight across every publisher, uh, you would find that this is not a broadly held belief. <laughs> It wasn't by us across a lot of our properties at that time. But we had the number of ads on our, our pages and we increased revenue, not just CPMs on an individual ad, total revenue on a page, total revenue per visit because of cleaner, better engagement, better ad quality, better ad performance, better user engagement because the pages loaded faster, were cleaner, were simpler. Um, they, I, I use a attention span as a finite thing. Um, and so to take ads off the page, we found that uh, drastically improved. And not just with uh, working with our direct partners who were seeing spectacularly better performance from the ads when we uh, clean up the pages, but also in the open market, right? The most blind of all blind buying where you have machines optimizing. The machine learning side of the, the world learned too, right? You take a poor 300 by 250 off the bottom of the page that nobody could see, and you know what? Every 300 by 250 that's left on your site suddenly looks like it's a lot better, and the markets value that, right? And you get direct incremental revenue benefit uh, from the open market uh, privileging that as well as your direct clients getting a much better quality of attention to the ad creator they're putting on there. And yes, you can have the ads on your page and make more money. It definitely, definitely works. Um, lazy loading is a very good idea. Don't put an ad on the page until somebody's actually going to see it. <laughs> I, viewability is there for a reason. Like up to that 70%, viewability linearly increases ad engagement. Above that, people have mostly seen it, right? Um, Get out of the way of your users and answer the question they have right now. This is important. Um, prioritize page speed, clean, simple design, and recommend things based off what you know about the user right now. Relevancy wins in ad targeting, just like it does with content, right? Using the signals of what people care about and putting an ad in front of them based on what they care about rather than what you infer from them from three months ago is important. It matters. Um, you can't be all things to all people, which means that about.com was the wrong product for the, today's internet. This is the biggest of all strategic pivots because we took one of the oldest sites on the internet and we broke it up. We took about.com and we uh, took about.com literally off the internet. You go there, you don't go to about.com anymore. It's one of the most backlinked domains in history. It doesn't exist. Um, so we launched six verticals, very well the balance, LifeWire, the Spruce, ThoughtCo, Trip Savvy. This is not a small initiative in the space of a year. <laughs> Uh, launching six top 10 vertical brands in 13 months with a company of 230 people um, is, let's call it ambitious, to put it mildly, like crazy would have been another way to think about this. Um, but it works, right? When you have a clean prediction, a stable baseline, you can see the world change. 
This is the prediction against that tech interest I showed you earlier on, right? That very volatile, highly changing seasonal interest in tech. This is daily traffic to LifeWire or the, the content that became LifeWire every single day across the year. We're within a few percent of exactly on our prediction for the first half of this until the launch, right? Which was just after October 1st. There's a bit of a dip as we relaunched and things got its feet. And then that is explosive growth, right? 50%, 80%, 100% growth, right? Which is where those lines project up to. And was the result of listening to our users, building for them, and actually producing the right product for the modern internet. You don't optimize or iterate into growth like this, right? You don't add 5%, 3% extra engagement and get this to happen. This is a big bet taken off really going deep and understanding the insights about your audience and then building the right thing, right? This is how, when you do it, you get the six fastest growing brands on the internet, all of which are top 10 or close to it in their category. Like the fact that we launched the Spruce, right? A big uh, lifestyle site in February, and it doubles in a month and a half, right? And this isn't doubling on a small number. This is doubling on 17, this got up to 17 million US uniques from a launch of 8.7, right? This is a big change. So I know we're close to time. These are some conclusions. Treat your content as an experiment, right? If you're a publisher, you are experimenting with the interest of the world. Set your strategy to answer questions you have about the world. Uh, if you are an advertising agency or if you are a brand, you can do the same thing. Like it's very, 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 very cheap to put a lot of content in front of lots of people. Right? Uh, an advertising campaign with 10 million impressions is not that big a campaign, but you are asking millions of people a question by doing that, and you're getting a really clean, unfiltered answer back from them. If they don't care, you will see it. If a subgroup does care, they will definitely see it. You absolutely can understand how people react to your creative when you put it in front of that many people. Thousands of people are highly predictable. Right? If you're looking at, looking at studies that talk about like hundreds of responses, you've got a lot of sample bias in there. You can still see very useful, very, very valuable, very detailed answers from that. But you should also remember to look at the big data set. You've got the whole campaign that ran all of the data that was in that bucket um, because that's a much more stable sample. Publishers use their content to listen to the world every day. Right? If you're working with a publisher, um, you absolutely should know that they understand their audience, like their audience when they are with them. Right? Um, they're going to know them better than anyone. Uh, and so they should be able to give you insights about that audience. People are a lot more varied than the cookies. So we're different people every time we come to the internet. And it's easy to forget that. Uh, and when you learn from your users and build for them, the results absolutely can be exclusive. Um, thank you for your attention and time. I know we've got a little bit of time for a couple of questions. Um, I know we are running a little. <laughs> Th th thanks so much, Dr. Roberts. That was really phenomenal content. Um, obviously very compelling to our audience. We have lost a total of zero people uh, since since starting 58 minutes ago, so I, I truly appreciate it. Um, I have a handful of questions. I'm, I'm going to focus on one that's probably the most um, practical, and, 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 I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll just start there, and if we have time for another, great. Um, you, you've mentioned a few times um, how fortunate you are as a company to have such rich data. Uh, if, if you don't have two, data, two, two decades of data and data science uh, and a data science team, how, how do you apply some of this on a practical standpoint? Yeah, I mean, it's the, the two things that you really need to do there are um, have a means of getting to data to scale that makes a difference, right? That, that gets you uh, something sensible and just a clean expectation of what you expect to find, right? So um, it is very cheap to get a very large sample on the internet, right? If, like if you want to run an ad on Facebook, right? It can cost you cents on the dollar to go get thousands or tens of thousands of, uh, of impressions there. And you can answer that question really quickly. Um, there are a lot of platforms out there that give you very clean reads on who responds to an ad like that. Like, so for example, one of the guys who was on my team uh, literally A-B tested his own face on Facebook, right, just for fun. Right? He got different glasses from Warby Parker, and he put an ad up on Facebook that said, like, like, like my face, um, and he ran that as a side-by-side -side test with two sets of glasses, and he got very clean signal very quickly for uh, less money than it cost him to buy the glasses. Um, his wife then told him that she didn't like the glasses that the entire internet had picked for him. And then he realized that uh, this was because he'd actually asked the entire country for responses. And when he narrowed it down to just ask women in New York uh, whether or not they liked his glasses, um, they actually picked the same glasses as his wife. As it turned out that A-B testing was correct, it was just much more geographically normalized. Um, 
that actually ended up costing slightly more than the glasses, but not very much, right? So you, a, a sense of curiosity and a clear idea of what you're asking uh, means that the tools that are out there are more than enough to get you very clean, very quick answers to that question. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you for all your insight. Um, thanks to Dennis uh, and the team for setting this up. Uh, this is going to conclude today's IAB webinar. Thanks to uh, the folks who presented and who set this up. Uh, thanks to you, to you all for listening. Uh, this webinar will be archived on the IAB website quite shortly. Uh, please check back in often to see our full calendar, uh, calendar of events and webinars at IAB.com, and we look forward to seeing you on a future webinar. Uh, very soon. Thanks so much, and thanks to everyone for participating today. Thank you very much. Thank you again.